where it needs to be. And oh, look at that. Three, two, one. You know, Sam, I've been uh, I've been holding out on you. Oh, yeah. Have you now? Oh, yeah. Uh, tomorrow I turn 30. <laughs> oh, my God, you old bastard. <laughs> I I've been getting a lot of that lately. Uh, my wife for like a early birthday thing she didn't want to spend too much money on a birthday cake so mm. when she went to the store she saw that someone had failed to pick up their funeral cake for a you know at, as you would imagine like a, a wake or some kind of uh service so since they uh, okay. didn't pick that up she's like well hey can i can i get that and they're like sure seven bucks off and then, uh, so it, the birthday cake says, uh, RIP. Then she just added to your 20s. Uh, and I'm just like, wow, thanks. So, what uh, you're telling me is she got a great deal on a cake. She got a great deal on a cake. And I mean, I'm diabetic, so I'm not too invested in cakes overall. So, right, right. I, I mean, the RIP is like all of the necessary, uh, what is it, double octandra, double meaning. Where right, it's just right. uh, like I'm diabetic. This cake could legitimate kill. It, it could kill me. It could be it symbolically kind of a, a death. It, it. Uh, the point is that like this is what you this is what you get when you marry goth girls that have a sense of humor. So you need to make the right choice, basically, is what you're telling us. Well, I'm not going to tell other people how to live their lives, but I will tell people that, that this is the kind of life that you can expect. Uh... <laughs> Ruin wishes for you to me. <laughs> I, I will say, uh, in terms of marriage and stuff, though, uh, mm -hmm. marrying the gamer girl, make sure that she had siblings growing up. Because, like, couch co op with a girl that, that was raised in the only child uh, fashion, uh, she, like, if, like, it mentally hurts her to see a split screen. So forget about that. <laughs> <laughs> Rest in peace of those dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I think I've uh, been able to successfully play some split screen with her like a, only a few times. And uh, the, the most recent iteration of that working is Baldur's Gate. Mm -hmm. Me, <laughs> funny enough, me and my girlfriend recently uh, gotten into playing League together. <laughs> <laughs> well, you and, know, that, that's yeah. some bonding experience right there. It it's honestly been a lot of fun. <laughs> I mean, it beats the fuck out of Baldur's Gate. I mean, trust me, I love a good D and D experience, and Baldur's oh. Gate's fantastic. When I'm not being cucked by a goddamn vampire while I'm playing it, this is true. Everyone makes that choice. <laughs> I haven't even played it, and even I know. <laughs> I have my ch baby just hanging around, babbling about, toddling about. I guess on that note, I guess we should start the show. Without further That's ado. Good. Welcome to Dungeons and Talk Shows, the talk show that brings you monsters, news, goth girls, and homebrews. I am your host, Orion. And I am your host, Sam. Unfortunately, I am not a goth girl. I'm sorry to let you guys down. Mm, but you're still the wife who we want, so. Thank you. <laughs> the, the fans Just input the that, am I a pretty girl, Spongebob meme, please. <laughs> Yep, and we have another wonderful guest with us uh, this week. Why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, hi, I'm Alden McClure. Uh, I uh, do a lot of gaming, um, mostly uh, Magic and D&D, &D. Mm. so uh, pretty heavy into that. I do uh, love anime, and I'm just like a connoisseur of all things geek, I guess you could say. Oh, yeah. I, I can see that. Like, uh, like your your entire surroundings are uh, anime posters, uh, game stuff, uh, all, all over the place. Like, see a little R two D two. Oh yeah. 
All right. And I understand that you recently started like a, a kind of a podcast of sorts. Uh, yeah. Um, we're we're still we're still figuring it out. There's a lot of scheduling issues with uh, some of the people, commitment issues. So uh, we're we're still we're still figuring it out. Um, but uh, we're we're definitely trying to get it up off the ground. Um, uh, so uh, essentially, it's uh, it's uh, swag. Um, so yeah, um, we're trying to do mostly uh, CDH um, content. Uh, which, uh, for people that don't know, CDH is a uh, competitive uh, elder Highlander, um, which is commander for for more yeah. recent oh, people. For magic, so uh, so it's Magic the Gathering. Gotcha, uh, gotcha. I was a little lost. But... Yeah, it's uh, so <laughs> Together, I've, I've, yeah. I've I've been playing Magic for oh god since the nineties. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of old terminology. Uh, EDH uh, is an old terminology, which is Elder Dragon Highlander, which uh, for the original magic, for the original commander, you could only use, it was like five dragons, I think there were, ah. and they were all uh, all part of the shards, uh, three colored, and those were the only commanders you were allowed to use because those were the only legendary creatures that you uh, had at the time, and you had to build your commander uh, deck around them. Mm. So, um, okay. yeah, so that's where the name and Highlander means, like, from the show, there can be only one. So you're only allowed one copy of any one card in your deck. Oh, those? Okay. Oh, okay. Those are, those I, are, like, I always thought know, it was, like, like, uh, like it stood for something else, like, uh, exactly 100 cards. <laughs> mm, that's <laughs> also interesting. I, I always kind of find those formats a little more exciting. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. They're, uh, they can be very, very fun on the casual side, and they can be very, very fun on mm. the competitive side. Like, you know, <laughs> if you're Sorry. No, no, go ahead. Um, so, like, if you have a very competitive nature, if you really like just like grinding and winning and things like this, uh, it's a you have CDH and things like that, where it's like all competitive, high level things like this. But even that has like a more casual, fun side to it too. And then like you can build everything from like very low powered all the way up to mid to high power. So like it has it has something for just about everything. I think Commander is probably one of the better formats that, that Magic's ever come out with. I'd absolutely have to agree. And honestly, when I was in high school getting my friends into playing Magic and, you know, running our own little McDonald's loiter squad, go in, we'll just loiter around in the McDonald's playing Magic for a few hours. <laughs> like, okay, it would have been better to be running commander because we'd always have like three or more people so it's just standard is not at all a conducive format for having three plus it's functional just n not the best yeah commander was built with multiplayer for in, in in ideas so like most 60 card formats it's really good if it's just you and your friend just one-on-one -on -one. you just grind out games and have fun that way mm -hmm. but commander is is a it's a social dynamic you have multiple people at the table there's politics there's there's ways that where you can look over your uh, another guy at the table and be like hey we need to deal with this person let's team up like you know let's let's have a <laughs> temporary temporary alliance a little, a little more strategy to it yeah yeah uh there certainly was a lot of that when uh, we would be uh, doing that, loitering around uh, the KFC and whatnot. And it's just like, uh, hey, you kind of like lock eyes with your friend, like, yo, you, you and me, <laughs> we got this. Let's get this guy. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, I think one thing that has really stood out to me, and out of the old, all the recent sets of Magic. Is uh, what is it? The uh, Outlaws at the Thunder Junction, or or whatever it's outlaws called. Outlaws, yeah, yeah. Outlaws at Thunder Junctions. Yeah, like that just looks like in my D and D brain, such an amazing setting to kind of go into. Like, uh, I'm anyone who's listened to the show for any length of time knows that I love Eberron. I like the mm. the aesthetic of like some technology, some magics. And some trains. I was a train kid growing up, so like, if, if there's going to be some trains involved and some Wild West and some magic guns, sign me up. You're that kind of tism as a kid. <laughs> yes, I am that kind of tism. <laughs> I mean, Magic the Gathering has actually come out with quite a few settings that uh, D and D's use, which is really cool. Most people don't know Ravnica, 
uh, mm. the guild uh, master uh, was it master's guides to Ravnica? Ah, uh, yeah, guild that, master's guide. Yep, that's that, one that's of the actually more a, notable ones. And they did a Ravnica. book for Strixhaven, as well and as they was, yeah they had uh, a bunch of uh, little PDFs that came out for other uh, settings, such as a uh, Zendikar and. Uh, uh, Innistrad, which uh, Innistrad basically, as far as the setting goes, it's so grim dark. You you might as yeah. well be running Curse of Strahd and be like Curse of Innistrad. Uh, you, you guys ready? Like yeah, yeah, basically. Oh, yeah. That's basically how that one would go. But uh, I think that there's a lot to be said for the multiverse that magic has and how underutilized fundamentally the, their settings are. Like, uh, you'd think that there'd be more overlap between D&D and magic considering all these amazing play settings. Very mm-hmm. true. I mean, there's, there's a whole realm called Ixalan where um, essentially it's, it's dinosaurs and pirates. Like it's 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 very interesting. Like you know, we have pirates on the open sea, and then dinosaurs on all the islands that blot around and stuff like that. That sounds a very yeah, interesting, right. interesting mm. setting that I'd love to ride around. That is, and like uh, if I'm not mistaken, Sam, uh, you had kind of a kind of a look right there. I, you had like a twinkle in your eye, sir, when he mentioned dinosaurs. What is the monster of the week? Very, very coincidentally, it, it does happen to be dinosaurs this week. <laughs> <laughs> got him. We got, got him, em. boys. What, what's, uh, what's the chance of that? So, yeah, I kind of <laughs> wanted to talk about, you know, dinosaurs in D&D, you know, kind of the status of a behemoth, you know. Mm. I know velociraptors are a thing, and mm-hmm. like in a previous campaign that I was running, like a bunch of my players wanted to like after they completed the main quest line that I had set up for them, they wanted to take a trip down to Chult so that mm-hmm. the druid could learn to transform into a velociraptor, and so that the uh, ranger could find himself a a new uh, companion. Because that's, uh, that's a good like objective to go there yeah because like they they had the money they had the means they had the transportation available and they're like and i kind of like laid the groundwork so they could kind of uh transition into tomb of annihilation if they really wanted to and you know i love that you mentioned you know going to chult because i know some people out there who don't know D &D lore and the the, you know sword codes and shit like that (laughs) well they they know that the Forgotten That's Realms right. is only the Sword Coast is remembered realms. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but they may not know that Chult is like an actual island where dinosaurs are like known to live. Yeah, and I, but kind of, a... I do kind of talk about that a little bit here. So I mean, there's a. Gonna... I was going to say that there's a very famous dinosaur on that island that uh, that, mm-hmm. that shows up shows up in in uh, Tomb of Annihilation, which is uh, the King of Feathers, and it's yeah. a really cool dinosaur that can teleport summon bees things like that it's yeah. it's it's, it's a really awesome. really cool even uh going to talk a little bit about the uh, patron deity the uh what's it called so, all right so you want me to go ahead and get started yeah you can go right in i mean patron Lady, deity of dinosaurs Lady is this a thing Pearl. oh shit we have that I'm vibing with it. I love it. (laughs) So, yeah. Dinosaurs in D&D, also known as Thunderers, Behemoths, or Garuda, were a group of ancient reptilian creatures found on Toro. They were considered agents and children of the cult and deity of Tao. Some of them had turned rogue to serve as enemy Ishodao. Ishodao. <laughs> it's like so, they were just making up words at that point. I mean, a lot of D&D do kind of just sound like they put in like a name generator. <laughs> <laughs> no, we would <laughs> never as DMs uh, caroose the internet for a... Uh, you know, kind of sketchy, probably made in the early I've, '90s I've website. Never that in my life names. Gone to those many, 
many where you type in a keyword and you're like, yeah, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> We're, we are grown men. We use chat GPT, sir. These days in the future. <laughs> so dinosaurs, everyone knows you know, pretty much what dinosaurs is, comes in many shapes and sizes. Though as the name behemoth implied, the best known are typically very large. They could either be herbivores Herbivores. I can't say words. Herbivores, sorry, or carnivores, depending on their species. Unlike dragons, dinosaurs were incapable of speech or non intelligent by nature. Dinosaurs came in many varieties, from small to large, but most shared a number of physical features. They were, for instance, all covered in a layer of pebble like skin. Most also demonstrated a well determined and developed sense of smell, which predatory behemoth used to hunt. All right. Yeah. So, you know, pretty pretty basic dinosaur facts. You know. I'm getting into the patron deity that I mentioned a little bit. So, Ubtau was the patron deity of the isolated region of Cult, and indeed the creator of Cult and founder of Mesra. The father of the dinosaurs stayed distant from both mortals and other deities, and he seemed to be above the daily doings of the world of its followers. This might have been partly due to his origin as a primordial. Uh, this alleged betrayal of the him owning him as his title as the deceiver, and it remained unclear that if he was even a deity in the traditional sense. Hmm. After the time of troubles, Uptop began to show interest in his followers. So... I'm you yeah. had me at dino god <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the idea of this is really cool and i go on to talk a little bit about his avatar that he uses when he does kind of interact with his followers okay is this avatar a like a t-rex because uh i'll be disappointed he, he if it's have, anything smaller he does have a dinosaur form but uh in his mortal form basically he appeared as a tabaxi human Male with dark brown skin, short cropped black hair, trimmed goatee, and a distant look in his dusky eyes. His age was hard to pinpoint as he appeared ageless, and the color of his skin symbolized the dark brown fertile earth of his jungles. Okay, so it's like a tabaxi pan. Mm -hmm. So the father, father of dinosaurs could cast any spells from any sphere or school of magic, but greatly favored the spheres of animal, combat, divination, elemental, plant, protection, sun, thought, and time, hmm. as well as the schools of abjuration, evocation, and divination. In his dinosaur form, Oktau was the biggest and strongest creature found on the entire Colton Peninsula. His sheer, brutal dinosaur strength was in for the deity's keen tactical mind. The dinosaurs' forms, claws, were strong enough to shred a humanoid body to a pulp in moments. However, the T-Rex's bite was even more dangerous. Uptow's dinosaur shape could swallow a large creature or anyone smaller, which was an instant and painful death to the engulfed. Hmm. <laughs> that, that's great. <laughs> His tail was a deadly blunt force that could shatter walls, and when the tail struck a creature, they were likely to become stunned, unable to function for between 4 and 14 minutes. All creatures who gazed into Uptal's eyes became entangled by the jungle's vegetation unless they were lucky enough to avoid her strength. Additionally, all dinosaurs within a mile from the god's avatar were fully under his control, willingly obeying Uptal's telepathic commands. All right, all right. So, like, dude, I imagine pissing a this <laughs> dino god off. Like, oh, shit, you done fucked up now. I'm sending my avatar of hey. me, and it's a, you know, big old dino tank. It just rushes in, just busts I love the down. idea that he's just, like, he's just chilling in his in his island. He's just like, yeah, this so is my like... shit. <laughs> he's like, I'm the top dog. You better respect it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the top T-Rex. <laughs> <laughs> I like to imagine it's like one of those badass uh, kind of dinosaurs with like a uh, like little mini like kind of shreddy kind of horns on the face like just a little being, extra badass. Being labeled as the deceiver though is interest. Hmm. Ah, maybe the dino illusion. I don't know. I mean, I believe I know. Pretty sure the primordials have a 
tenuous history with the gods, right? So, oh, okay. I kind of imagine it's probably early, and I think I do have a little bit here. Uh, it was widely believed that scholars from Candle Keep that dinosaurs existed in Toro since before the time period known as the Days of Thunder. In those ancient times, various species of dinosaurs thrived until a cataclysm changed the world so drastically, and most of them went extinct. Sages from Candle Keep didn't have a unified theory about the nature of the catastrophe. The most commonly accepted theory proclaimed that this catastrophe was the tear fall, while the while D factors of this theory believe that the sun's temperatures diminished to a degree that produced a global climatic change so harsh that only the smallest were able to survive. A lunatic huh. sage even proclaimed that the cataclysm was actually a war between the gods and their enemies, which we know is actually what it was. <laughs> Okay, so the uh, gods and uh, shit just kind of fighting, tearing shit up. I mean, yeah. uh, there's been so many uh, major wars between races and mm-hmm. things within just D and D in general. I mean, uh, come on, dragons and giants have right. when when they get down and they have a fight. That's basically uh, terraforming an entire region. Oh yeah, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that the Days of Thunder are like the world is healing after the cataclysm that was the fight between the primordials and the gods. Yeah, like, uh, dude, if, I don't know too much on that lore, but I do know that it was, like, enough for, where, like, primordials, like, okay, we're going to yeah. split this stuff. Because yeah, I know that that's when, like, dragons, like, really got involved. Yeah. Like, oh, we could take this shit. <laughs> like... Yeah, and then, like, Dragonborn are from, like, uh, the Primordial uh, Mm -hmm. world with all the uh, dragons. And, like, Dragonborn are, are, like, uh, just kind of a slave race created for the the dragons. Yeah, because after the the planet was kind of, like, sundered or whatever by this, like, fight, you know, the dragons and their Dragonborn were like, it's our time. The humans are bodied. The gods are gone. Primordials are fucking (laughs) trash. (laughs) (laughs) It gets wild real quick. Yeah. Uh, I'm very curious what dinosaurs, or I guess what dragons would think of dinosaurs, if they would just kind of see them as, like, reptilian animals, or they're kind of like, ah, cousins. I would would actually (laughs) say it would be kind of like what we look at, like, monkeys are. Yeah, like, yeah a, I think a, I would argue de-evolved, that too. Right, uh, yeah. a, like a lesser race type of thing. Like, you're kind of DNA. related. Yeah. 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 I imagine, or I wonder if a dragon would, like, see, like, this island of Colton, right, and be like, I could, I could, I could do some fuckery with this. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, basically, like, it, it's kind of like, uh, if a dragon shows up in a scenario like that, it, it's straight up like Tarzan. You become uh, oh, a, yeah. a king shit of dumbass island. Yeah, but then I imagine Uptown's going to show up and be like, um, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> well, if I remember a lot of lore about him, he doesn't really care too much about yeah, his creation. Uh, there's only been one time where he's personally stepped in, which was the, not the city of Ohm, but there's mm. a, a city of Mar- Maron or whatever. Mesro, he kinda like I believe. Mesro, that's what it was. And he just like took it. He just took yeah. the whole city. It took it out of time and space. So it's really, it's yeah. this trap somewhere, and yeah, that's one of the only he, times. The dragon, so he probably he may he may not really care, but I, they are like his kids, so he's probably like. Yeah, I do know of two major dragons in Schultz. Uh, I don't remember yeah. their names off the top of my head. There's a red, there's a young red dragon that lives in a volcano, and then there's a green yes. dragon that lives off one of the islands of Schultz. It's mm-hmm. So, yeah, that makes sense. It's so, just a it's a whole big. Basically, uh, what Jurassic Park of the D and T world? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> so, whatever the truth, only a handful of dinosaurs, among them the proto dragons, were able to survive and evolve to the members of species that exist in the present age. Like dragons, predatory dinosaurs had a powerful lust to hunt. The razor sharp teeth, suitable for rending prey apart, were also highly territorial. Herbivorous dinosaurs were also usually less aggressive. Although when defending their young or wounded after being started or irritated, they could become vicious enemies. Dinosaurs often lived in areas very much isolated from any human habitation. They usually were found in remote mountain valleys, isolated rocky plateaus, dense tropical island forests, 
were secluded in the deepest and darkest of the jungles. So All dinosaurs, right. for, for people in their games who may, you know, want to seek out dinosaurs or whatever, or see if they exist within like their setting, they only exist in Toro and in Cult and Malatra. So like these two islands, they could also apparently be found on the Ivan River Lorath by way of like time portals into the past. All something. right, all right. So like uh, traditional D and D settings, like uh, few and far between, but they you can right. find them. Some and naturally, them. for your own homebrew settings, right? It, players are going to find ways to abuse dinosaurs. So like maybe just kind of a. Uh, let them hunt for it a little bit. Like you got to work yeah. to deal with the dinos, you know. Yeah, like they would be—they'd be a rare species. People would have to go seek out. Like, mm. like I imagine it's kind of similar to people who are like, "Oh, I want this specific familiar creature," right? Like, or I want to find like this specific creature as a companion. They have to like go on the mission to find it. Mm. So I'm just gonna be like in the nearby city, <laughs> like yeah, like, travel two days to get there. <laughs> yeah, I do think that is a problem that a lot of DMs kind of run into with players, where it's just like a lot of players really do just expect things to just kind of be there, always available, and mm. like. I mean, and your average DM is going to be like, hey, you really need to work for this stuff. But uh, I have seen uh, in recent years that there is kind of an unhealthy expectation in the community. And like, uh, yeah, sure. like if you go on Reddit and someone's like, oh, hey, this, this guy's not letting you uh, do your thing and play your character the way you want to play them. Like, uh, you know, fuck that guy. Leave that game. And it's just like, no, dude, I just I think that if you want something, you got, you kind of have to work for it. Yeah, I mean every every hero story or every like human made god has like a path to the power, right? Yeah. You don't just get your like handed to you <laughs> or stolen from a magic shop because you were lucky. Like, <laughs> uh, dude, the, the one time we had a player in one of our games that just straight robbed an entire magic store. It's like, dude. What what do you mean the man that runs the magic store doesn't have magics protecting the magic store? <laughs> yeah. How, like magic that you would even not even know how to detect. Like <laughs> I'd I have alarms like, on everything. <laughs> I wouldn't clap you on notice. Like I don't know. The checks have to be pretty high, I feel like. Yeah, you know, something reasonable. But yeah, I um, so I do have a list of you know all the dinosaurs you can expect to find there, and a little bit of a description about them. I don't, I don't know if you really want me to go through; it's pretty long. It's no, I, I think of, we all know of, like what a dinosaur is. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, you, got, you know, you got the dimetrodons, di- you know, brontosaurus. You got everything. Some of them though are a little more interesting, like the ankylosaurus, for example, are specifically known as mace tail behemoths. Ah, yeah, those are badass. Yeah, so some some of them are a little more highly, like, you know, noticed. Like uh, Stegosaurus or Blood blood Spike Behemoths. Hmm. You know, those are really cool. I would imagine that there's a lot of inspiration, like, seeing as there are actual dinosaurs in D&D, but, Mm -hmm. uh, like... uh, like Alden was saying earlier, with the uh, was it Ixalan, uh, uh set, Ix- Ixalan, yeah, yeah Ixalan. Uh, with that entire setting, like you could really run a full dino uh, heavy campaign, and, like, and I find it so weird that Saurians aren't like an official race, you know. Even mm. though like they've recognized that cult exists and Mizra and all that, why couldn't there be like a race of intelligent dinosaurs? Like, I mean, if the terror folk come close. Yeah. The terror folk come close, but, like, I think that's kind of, kind of the only ones that I've ever come across. Yeah, like, I ran the, you know, a Tricera in one of our games, and, like, I think it's such a cool idea to have, like, an ancient race be, like, a dinosaur. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because it's just, it's interesting, and theoretically, they'd be a relatively long-lived species. Because, mm-hmm. like, a uh, I mean, how far off can they be in relation to something as long lived like a turtle? You know. Yeah, and I mean, we have fucking we have fucking turtles and dragon folk and loxodons and like, 
fucking lizard folk. <laughs> so why not? Folk. <laughs> yeah, Eric got fucking. <laughs> yeah, there, there's everything and anything. And I just think that, my dinosaur man. You, know, I, you can get real primal with that kind of stuff in like uh, with an Ixalan uh, type campaign setting. Just imagine your barbarian being like, oh, cool. We just killed a Triceratops. I want to make its shield my shield. <laughs> It, yeah, well, I get, Triceratops head shield would go crazy. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be so awesome. I mean, I guess you could just like flavor your your lizard folk characters like a raptor or whatever. But you know, and Saurian homebrews do exist. You know, I ran one, mm. but uh, that was cool as them being recognized in like the official books. <laughs> one of the last times I played uh, as a, as an actual character. Um, I played a lizard folk druid barbarian that uh, I, I completely uh, only, if I was a, a druid, I only turned into dinosaurs. I would nice. refuse to use, I, I crippled my, uh, I kind of like narrowed myself where it was like, I only turned into dinosaurs because I actually, uh, my character came from Chult. He was from the, the oh, lizard yeah. folk side of Dude, ever, <laughs> ever since I watched that like Goblin Slayer, I've wanted to play the Lizard Folk Shaman. <laughs> like Ah yeah. Like I've seen some good homebrew shaman classes on like I think uh, Shaman is such a cool like It, it know, really is. Very into like a cleric or like a like a druid, you know. Yeah, I feel like uh, if you wanted to take a step outside of D&D &D to play a good shaman character, uh, Pathfinder has a solid shaman class last I checked. Yeah. interesting. Yeah, like uh, back in the day when I used to mix uh, 3.5 with Pathfinder uh, just because you can and there's just so many good classes that came out of all of that. But yeah, that that is all I pretty much have on dinosaurs today. It's pretty much what you'd expect from, you know, dinosaurs. They don't do anything too crazy. They're all about what you'd expect. Uh, mm. The CRs kind of vary between them, obviously. Uh, that being said, though, uh, as far as the IRL fight score, I'm going to give it a 7. <laughs> and... Full Jurassic Park scenario. <laughs> oh, yeah. Full Jurassic Park. Like, if you've ever seen Jurassic Park... Oof. Yeah, it, it, it's like that. Your, your survivability really is give and take. And I'd say, you know what, as far as that goes, uh, my ingenuity is purely dependent on what the situation is and what I'm fighting. But, like, yeah. most of the time, you ain't getting that far. Yeah, we'll, we'll say, like, in this situation, you get dropped on the island of Chalk. Like, you're like, you gotta, you gotta make it to your ship or something yeah. on the other side. I'm cooked. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't think I've ever played Ark, and I don't think I want to live it. <laughs> I played a lot of Ark, and you die a lot. <laughs> yeah, point in case. Nothing like, like a good old arc you step simulator. Off the beach, you're like, all right, I grab some wood, punch that first tree. There's a raptor behind that wall. And you're like, it's over. <laughs> a D and D no, arc. Now that that's a thought. D and D arc would be really fun. I mean, that that's basically uh, how a game like that would run. Like, yeah, I mean, you your party gets like washed up on a beach or something. <laughs> Yeah, you gotta do a lot of survival checks. That would be like, really cool. Actually. That's a fantastic <laughs> premise. Yeah, you're all on some ship or whatever, and they get washed up. I mean, I'd suddenly give, you're on the island of Chult. <laughs> I'd actually give points for like people that actually. Would, uh, I, I I would, I would be less. I, I I would yeah. I was gonna say I'd be less uh, inclined to just like pure mechanics and just be like, you know, if you know how to make a spear, you know. Just walk me through it, and you can make a spear. You know, you can make a yeah. things like that. You know, mm. use your actual ingenuity as a as a player, mm -hmm. and uh, I'd flavor it with the character. You know, just kind of just like allow allow people to use their actual mind rather yeah. than just roll dice and just be like, okay, well, you make it, or oh, you don't know how to make it. Yeah, right. That would be that would be something that like tool proficiencies would come in really handy, and like yeah. Uh, you know, stuff like that because you would you'd be coming into it with no equipment no starting mm -hmm. gear like no starting weapons nothing i can imagine the i kind of like this idea now 
Somebody out there make this. <laughs> it might be too okay. I it would be really cool because like your your the counters would be a lot different. Like, you know, because like most people are flavored because they have like all the weapons they want. They get to pick all the equipment they want, or right, uh, right they out. They feel game. strong. They feel capable. Mm. You go into it, you're like, I have no. We could run into the smallest dinosaur or anything that could take us out. Like, mm -hmm. We got to fight this raptor bare fisted with two casters, with no books. Like, <laughs> I, I think that'd be very interesting, just for the sheer fact of. <laughs> If you put such a heavy emphasis on survival, that'd be really cool. For just like, okay, you have these proficiencies. Let's see you build X, Y, and Z items to match those proficiencies. And, you know, make crafting a relatively easy process, but mm. also you just have to go and get materials for this process, you know? Level make a check, and then, then, like, that kind of determines the quality of what you've crafted. I, yeah, I was going to say, I wouldn't even make it that bad. Like, you still have a functioning weapon, but it depends on what happens. Like, if you get, like, a a, a, a a crit fail or a crit success, you know, like, if you get a crit fail because your item is not really crafted that well, it actually just shatters. It mm -hmm. just breaks on a, on a failure. But, mm -hmm. you know, but if you made it really, really nice, a crit fail is just, it's just a bad miss because it actually hits it, the durability of the thing, stuff like that. Put, like, all the reward reward-based yeah. system into it. For, for people that put forethought into it. Yeah, I mean, like, at that point, you could... I could easily see, like, a quality system being introduced for mm. uh, the sake of, like, if everything's going to be crafting, then it wouldn't be unrealistic to throw in a quality uh, rating. And it's just like, okay, the quality rating could basically be, like, a, a, a simple... Uh, Mm, uh, maybe like a DC, you know, yeah. just, just like, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm not sure. Like it, it would be, it would have to be something real simple. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Or maybe something along the lines of like a proficiency bonus. That'd be like a, like a hard survival campaign. <laughs> you wash up on the beach with a point of exhaustion. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I like it though. Yeah, that that would be something, for sure. All right, so we can go ahead and move into our news today. Yeah. I heard yeah. you told me we had a lot of stuff. Uh, yeah, we do. So, <laughs> buckle up, everyone. Get ready for nerd. This is TNF bringing you nerd news. All right, guys, nerd news this week. Are y'all familiar with the uh, YouTuber uh, Tulok the Barbarian? Barbarian. Yeah. yeah. He makes uh, those really cool character builds. Yes. So, like, uh, there's hundreds of characters. Like, you find a character in media, throw a rock at it. If it's popular enough, it's probably something he's covered on his uh, channel. Mm -hmm. Everything from Luigi, Mario, uh, Zelda, Samus. Mm -hmm. you, if it's I've been in Smash. Like Deadpool, Spawn. Oh, you know? uh, yeah. He, he's covered, like, anything and everything, mm -hmm. dude. So, uh, he's gotten a little... Uh, he, he's lost his passion, you know? Uh, not really feeling it too much. He, People have kind of been seeing this coming for a while now. Uh, he made a goodbye video, and he the last uh, video he made for building a character was building the end from uh, Metal Gear Solid, uh, based on the character the end. So, uh, if any of you guys that are familiar with the game, but uh, congratulations, character build yes. and a pun. <laughs> what more could you ask from Tulok, right? And he has moved on to creating uh, primarily Elden Ring content, from what I understand, because uh, he had been doing a lot of Elden Ring stream type stuff for quite some time. So hey, as long as he's happy, you know, a yeah, lot of YouTubers kind of move away from stuff a of, nowadays. A lot of hot content. 
Absolutely. I mean, I definitely don't blame him. He did the character build for what, like five, six years, something like that. Oh yeah, like that, that's a long time to be doing something, and eventually you just you lose steam. I mean, uh, everything comes to an end. Eventually, this podcast will be the same way. You know, like eventually, all you just, the podcast you will in the the end of days. <laughs> Also, it's foretold in the prophecies. <laughs> Absolutely. Moving on, uh, Sam. I, I mentioned this uh, not too long ago. You you familiar with the the famous uh, Red Box Warrior? You know the the old uh, like what was it A D and D like the, one of the early editions, the most the, the iconic uh, Red Box set. Like uh, you give it to a kid like in the seventies, <laughs> eighties, and they're like, oh hey, uh, your first D and D. Here you go, kid. Uh, just go for it. Roll some dice. I'm, I'm gonna be real. I have no idea what the Red Box is. Um, well, it's literally just like a a starter set that was in a red box. <laughs> like, ah. like when they say red box warrior, it's just like it was a red box, and there was like a a, a, a your typical Conan style warrior on the cover fighting a fucking dragon, looking oh. all barbarian and badass. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm not sure about now. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. So. Uh, WotC, in their infinite wisdom, has decided to release a little character figure for this uh, mysterious, nameless warrior, and have decided that this character is really just kind of a uh, uh, very, uh, very squared off looking uh, woman. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. A lot of people are really upset with that, and I can understand why, because, like, uh, if anyone who's familiar with, uh, what is it, Larry Elmore's art style, now, I had to research this uh, when I was reading on the subject, because I'd heard the name Larry Elmore before, and it it turns out I've actually seen a bunch of his work, like, all over the internet over the years. Uh, he has a very distinct uh, style when he draws. Like, uh, you, you know those overly stylized, like, uh, fantasy women with, like, the bikini armor? And they're, like, all, like, uh, mm-hmm. <clears throat> barely any clothes on. And, like, he, he draws men in basically the same way. Bar- nice! Quality! Just, oh, yes, yeah, like, uh, the women are sexy and the men are burly in this man's art style. And mm-hmm. I'm just, like... Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I, I, I understand that, you know, that women need to be represented in things and whatnot. Perfectly fine. We, I love me a badass woman. Nothing more erotic than a woman who can kick my ass. But... Xena. We, exact, actually, I fucking love Xena <laughs> growing up. Don't even get me started. Yeah, Those exactly. chalk rams went hard. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Oh, that, but it's just... <clears throat> There is just lines to be crossed when you go retconning an artist's work. Like, he, he didn't sign off on this. He didn't agree to a Watsy to just be like, oh, yeah, you know that thing you drew, like, uh, 30 years ago? Yeah, what about it? Well, th- that man's a woman now. Excuse, yeah. excuse me? Like, I drew this. Art is up to interpretation, but I drew this. Like, they didn't like just like make a different piece. That that it would have been so easy to do like literally anything else. They, so wait, wait, wait. So they took the exact image and just made it a woman. Yes. That's weird. Yeah they 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 took the the image. They created a a little three D model, made a little a mini that you can put on your uh, your table, and Ooh. when you t- flip it around, it's got tits and a dumpy face. <laughs> I mean, cool, I guess. But I mean, why don't they just like make their own? It it like, just a different. Art? <laughs> I I think for me, at the end of the day, it's just fucking rude. You don't do that to someone's art. Like that's just yeah. horribly disrespectful. Like I don't walk up to, like I wouldn't go up to a curatorial and be like, "Yo, that Goku bitch is one hot broad." <laughs> I mean, Watsy. Watsy's done a lot of things like this. I uh, I know this is probably old news, but like uh, I want to say five years ago, they did a whole thing where um, the storyline with the Planeswalkers and Magic: The Gathering, 
there was um, a, a relationship that was happening between um, uh, Chandra and Nissa. And uh, an artist, a writer came in and was like, no, that, that's not happening. Actually, Chandra, it was a phase. It was a phase. And uh, now she's in love with Gideon. And it was just like, it was like someone coming in and, and saying, there's this whole storyline and all this lore based around this one thing that was established. And then someone just comes in and rips it out and just says, nope, nope, I want to put my own stamp on it. And I'm like, okay. And, and, th- and that's the thing is it's not always like, what people get mad about yeah obviously you get some people to get pissed off but when you when you change yeah. established lore about something or established imagery it kind of like irritates people that have been falling in love with the original stuff right. exactly yeah, i yeah. mean uh, come on like could you imagine if someone decided to like a uh, retcon shrek where like shrek is just this overly obese ugly chick like that kind yeah. of fundamentally yeah. changes <laughs> the entire story <laughs> Like, they, like, remade Pokemon the exact same way, but yeah. instead Ash is, a, like, it'd be, like, just so flavorless and, like, thoughtless. Yeah, it's and just, just like, 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 like if, like, in the Pokemon example, you said, like, there's so many interesting female characters, so m- many yeah. wonderful Poke women, like... Underused the, women characters and everything. Yeah, th- there really is, and there's plenty of amazing female characters out there, it's just, like... <laughs> Why is this the hill to die on? So like, true. Uh, famously, who asked? You know? <laughs> uh, I just wish that there'd be a lot less disrespect for established... Uh, like, the thing is, writers <laughs> and artists, like, what, whatever your medium, medium is, I think that, like, if someone writes something or creates something, there should be a certain level of respect to what has been done overall, like a g- general courtesy, you know, like yes. I- I'm not exactly that much of an artist, but I do consider myself to be an artist and just art is hard. Man. It-, it is. And there is a level of professional courtesy that should be industry wide. Honestly, like mm-hmm. it shouldn't be political uh, in my opinion to just like, Oh, people want to get up on their high horse and be like, oh, no, they're changing all the things. And uh, people are like, yeah, fuck yeah, they're changing all the things. And I'm just sitting in the middle like, dude, maybe just show some respect to the original people. Like, they did, did they sign off on this? Did they say it was okay? True. That's why, I think that's why people are so upset about, like, the AI art thing. Uh, like, that, that's a completely using, different thing. but like uh, Using people's art and stuff like that. Yeah, like, just taking someone's uh, art and doing whatever you want with it without permission. You know what? You're absolutely right. There's a big fight right now uh, uh, between two friends of mine at my card shop about that. Uh, There's a guy that's uh, using AI art to uh, create play mats and selling those play mats and things like this. And then there's another guy that's an artist and he he's really against it all. So there's, like, this big debate. I try to stay out of it because, like, the girl friends of mine but like yeah. i can see both sides but like i i, I get the I, I get the argument and the pissed off things of like it's kind of like stealing someone else's art and using it for your own thing so right. yeah like it, the whole thing is like really tricky to traverse you know what i mean because like yeah, yeah. <laughs> on one hand like there's tons of models out there that are built on straight ripping off people's work and on other on the other hand like say you strictly only use adobe to go and do your stuff well any artist that uses adobe has already consented to having their stuff ripped off because they hit the i agree to terms of service and adobe uses all that stuff uh, behind closed doors to teach their their models you know who post their stuff on like social medias that's the thing that they don't understand. Like they agree that like to let them use and take whatever is posted. Like as soon as you post it to a public platform, it doesn't belong to you. Like uh, unless you yeah. put like your stamp or your name or whatever on yeah, it. Like, you gotta sign all cool. your shit all the time, you know? And yeah. like it, it really is just there's a lot of crazy stuff and I I understand where artists are coming from, He's but I also it. understand that this is the same kind of reaction that whenever some kind of technology comes in, 
There's always going to be knee-jerk reaction. Oh, it's evil. Get rid of it. Well, listen, you can't stop this. It, it's AI. It's going to be everywhere all the time. We just didn't expect Skynet to come for the artist first. I'm sorry. Skynet's going to come for all of us, just uh, some faster than others. I mean, I see, I see it. Uh, so uh, my, my my daytime job, I guess you could say, my, 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 my normal job um, is I'm a, a, a cashier at a gas station. And we just got um, we just got uh, a self checkout there, which makes my job easier. I don't have to deal yeah. with as many customers. I can deal with more customers. I can get things done around the shop. It, it, it actually helps me and, and stuff like this. But I get so many comments of people saying, "Oh, it's going to take your job. Aren't you worried it's going to take my job?" And all this other stuff. And it's that pushback. It's that fear of the unknown of new yeah, technology yeah. coming and just taking your jobs because it did happen. It, it, it happened back yeah. when uh, the. Uh, uh, the self-automated assembly line happened, and it took mm-hmm. away a lot of people's jobs. A lot, of, job. people got fired, yeah. a lot yeah. of people got fired because of it. So there's this the stigma of new technology will take your job and take your 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 livelihood and stuff like this. But not all of it's that way. So yeah. you gotta like pick and choose and see where where that thing is. Some technology is insanely helpful for you, so you can be a more productive person at work or what you're doing. And then other times, yeah, you know, some people just do it where it, it does take it. So it's like that that balancing act of looking how far technology goes. Mm. Yeah, and without diving too much into that, because like honestly, that could be a whole episode in itself. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, exactly. we're on a bit of a tangent there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, tangents are what we do though. Oh, Moving sure. on for D and D news, the, the D and D live action show canceled. Rip up that script, boys, because that, that's gone. Rest in peace. I mean, good because <laughs> nobody asked for it, nobody wants it. Like I wasn't we got the we got, we got the critical role shows. We vibe with that. <laughs> like, yeah, and like they handle most of the production themselves, and honestly, Critical Role like has produced some good stuff. Nailed it. The show is it, so good. <laughs> uh, speaking of Critical Role, a uh, little bit of news on them too. Season yeah. three uh, just uh, got their. Uh, they just announced when it's coming out. I did. I watched the trailer last night. Oh yeah, looks good. Okay, so let's see. They have confirmed the release date for this article really likes to bury the lead it will release october 3rd this year so any of y'all uh getting ready for vox machina season three uh it's just around the corner coming this fall and i also saw online that uh they made a post on twitter about recording for mighty nine so uh, that's the uh, second uh, campaign that Critical Role has done, and also Dude. their most popular one. So yeah. we could expect something in- infinitely better than the whole Vox Machina thing, which was already I, pretty damn good. I, I always hoped that they would do these kind of like live, like animated yeah. shows. Because for all of us that don't want to sit around for like three hours per episode <laughs> listening to yeah. someone else play D and D, can't like I can't wait until for the the years in the future when they do campaign threes show. That's gonna be so good. Mm. Like I hear with the current campaign three, like uh, at this point in the campaign, it's kind of like falling off, and they've lost a lot of listeners. Someone died. <laughs> like it's it fell a lot off. Of content. A Their healer got cooked. <laughs> so I heard. Yeah, a lot of people like the Sam Regal, rest in peace. <laughs> he he was a big and then a promoter for them. He did a lot of the oh oh like, shit like advertisements a... for them. Damn. So no more. Fresh, uh, what was fresh it? Fresh cut, cut grass. grass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he went. I believe it was what two, three episodes ago. I don't want to spoil it for anyone who didn't listen. I mean, not much of a spoiler for me. Yeah, at this point, like, every, like everyone knows that he's not for it in first. the show anymore. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, first of grass I cook. But took out one of the major big bads. So. Ah, so they're wrapping that one up. Mm. And then last bit of our D&D news for this week. Uh, are you too familiar with the game Dead by Daylight? Vaguely. Yeah, you know, there's a... Yeah, 
play as a bunch of normal people, then one person in your group gets to be the serial killer, the the Jason, Wasn't... the alien, they the predator, that, uh, the, uh, that all one... kinds of uh, you know horror film icons have been put into uh, this game, and you have to go around. You got to kill the players, and like it, the he- game is heavily stacked against the players in this. And in that spirit, they have recently decided to add uh, one of uh, D&D's oldest villainous icons, Vecna himself. Pretty cool. Which uh, a a lot of people kind of know Vecna strictly from uh, a little bit of critical role, because there was like an appearance there apparently, and and Stranger Things. Yeah, Stranger Things. Uh, I Vecna mostly know Vecna like, from the classic story of uh, one D and D group going against another and be like, "Hey, you've heard of the hand of Vecna and the eye of Vecna? Does mm-hmm. anyone want to cut off their head and try the head of Vecna? Ooh, the fancy! Of Vecna? Yeah, the ball sack of Vecna. Uh, you know what we really Clothes need is the cock of Vecna. <laughs> the cock of Vecna. You know that's an ancient bardic <laughs> item right there. The cock ring of Vecna. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how uh, how Vecna items work is like uh, the he looks of... cool. Oh yeah, he he does. He looks badass. Like uh, the the hand of Vecna, you have to cut off your hand, and then in order to attune to it, you have to attach it where your severed hand was. Does the same with like that, the important? eye. You got to scoop out your own eye. <laughs> did they also put Vecna in Fortnite? <laughs> Uh, did they? I don't know. <laughs> I feel like everything goes in Fortnite. <laughs> everything <laughs> goes in Fortnite. Like after a little while <laughs> with did. Dead by Daylight, it, trust and believe it'll end up in there somehow. Oh my god! Oh yeah, this was okay. This was like two years ago. What? <laughs> there was a Vecna skin. Well, check this out uh, for all you crit roll nerds. Uh, Vecna is go- is voiced by Matt Mercer. Oh, true, true. So that, that's a cool little uh, thing we're thrown in there. Like, as if they didn't have enough killers. I kind of appreciate this, but at the same time, Watsi, for every good thing you do, there's going to be like several bad skeletons falling out of the closet all at once. So true. So true. Uh, I, I'm waiting for the next one. There, there's always something. Has any of you ever uh, read the new uh, um, precon uh, or module of uh, the uh, was it the Evil of Vecna? Uh, I no, know. I haven't. I've, I've yeah, heard it's, some uh, stuff about it though. It, it's okay. Um, it, it it it's one of the ones that uh, you're supposed to go around to like multiple planes. Uh, they're supposed to visit a whole bunch of things or whatever. Vecna's the big bad guy. It's supposed it like. Ah. Pulls in a lot of old school D and uh, D uh, players because it's it's a lot of uh, old old realms from like Greyhawk, Dragonlance, mm. uh, Emberon, um, uh, Bavaria. You know, like you go to all these different planes to get things. There's the Rod of Seven Parts in it, which is one of my most favorite uh, magical items to ever come across. Yeah, and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Yeah, my dad was, really loves Greyhawk, and, like, uh, really, uh, a lot of those settings are just, like, for old D&D players, they were amazing. And then, like, uh, fast forward to today, where it's just, like, we're only getting, like, little shavings of uh, those good settings. It's just, like, well, we got a single book that covers Eberron, and, like, I love Eberron. It's like, dude, can't we get another? <laughs> I think when they made a Dragonlance one, um, which wasn't that bad. Yeah, I did hear some good things about Dragonlance. Oh yeah. So there's 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 a lot of good old school settings: Dragonlance, Greyhawk, Eberron. Um, Faderin is pretty cool, but like you know, I, I feel like that one's the one that we explored the most. Like you know, maybe maybe stepping out of it a little bit. Hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. You know, all right. I'm kind of curious. What you say, Eberron's your favorite setting? Right? Yes, yes. What's your favorite uh, race out of out of all the D and D you've you've enjoyed? Hmm. Do you have a favorite? Oh, that's that's tough. 
Uh, there's really too many races to just simply pick one, honestly. Yeah, I, I feel like for me, it kind of floats between like Dragonborn and Warforged. Yeah, that makes sense. I've seen you play Warforged. You really go off on that. I liked it a lot. I like elephants. Oh, yeah, that makes or, sense. Or, or their their original thing where they came in was was Lexidon from. Hmm. Are they uh, elephants so. now? Uh, yeah, depending on the things, because uh, it, it's 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 owned. Both both properties are owned by Watsi. Um, it's just when someone else, like uh, I use um, the uh, fi- uh, 5e uh, character sheet for my mm-hmm. phone when I create new characters, and right. uh, almost all my all my players in my uh, campaign use it. Oh. And um, unfortunately, El- uh, Lexanon is copyrighted. So oh. uh, any other property can't use it. So they use, uh, uh, I think it's called Elephants, is, 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 which is Elephant Folk. Right, um, right. And they're really, really cool because yeah. they have a natural armor that doesn't need your decks. It makes it's, sense. It's, constitution? Yeah, it's a constitution. It's 14 nice. plus con. Um, nice. for, for, his, for, for his thing. So you can, you can have it be like a strong, like a strong oh. monk or, <laughs> um, you can be like fighters or whatever, where you don't need to wear armor, but you also oh. don't need to have a high dex. Right. So like w- very closely to like barbarian types gotcha. and yeah. So I, I really, really Ooh. love them. And they're also one of the biggest races. So if you want to play yeah. like a big boy, they're, they're, they're up there. They're, I mean, they weigh more, I, I think they weigh more than. Almost any other race, maybe the <laughs> the hippo folk. The um, oh, yeah, the gifts. <laughs> and my the, brother yeah, loves I, them because space hippos with guns. It's like the most American oh, yeah. thing. Oh boy! A- am I saying Americans are hippos? Maybe. I mean, uh, who who can say? I always think that they're British, like big game hunters. Oh yeah, <laughs> like like, <laughs> like the old the old like guys that go oh, to yeah. Africa to hunt the elephants and stuff like that. The old oh, that's the totally old, the old... their aesthetic, and it's great. I feel that. All right. Now, Sam, I got yes, us a is. little bit of homebrew this week. Oh and... boy. And as uh, you know, uh, Papa Orion always says. Uh, it, shit gets crazy in the generic realm. Generic realm, generic realm, lots of fun, excellent. Yes, welcome nice. to the generic realms. <laughs> Greyhawk and Eberron merge together. Forgotten realms. Yeah, that's just a continent for now. Joe Grass fusion. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, for this week's uh, homebrew, I bring to you guys a little something uh, called a, a better uh, a variation of the resting rules uh, called better resting. So, resting in fifth edition has always seemed a little off, and the following rule set is an okay. update to the resting mechanic in five e. It's meant to be flexible and easy to understand while maintaining. Uh, okay, don't throw in wor- long words just because you think you're smart, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Says the one that can't read. <laughs> uh, let's see. Versilimitude. Versilimitude. Yeah, you know what versilimitude is, motherfucker? I don't. Oh, look that shit up. Yeah. You- <laughs> versilimitude. <laughs> How do you spell this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can't read, huh? <laughs> this is not how I thought it was. I found it. Ah, you did. <laughs> the appearance of being true or real. All right. <laughs> you know, there, there's a French word that has four letters that works way better for that. <laughs> All right, so rest in, necess- uh, rest in necessity levels. Warmth, shelter, food, and comfort. So warmth, like, you know, if you have, like, a, a fire or a thick blanket. Shelter, yeah. obviously, like, uh, you know, you got something to kind of protect you from the elements. Food that can be scavenged or brought along the journey. And comfort, like, uh, say maybe you rest in an inn or a hotel or maybe you have like a a base of operations to go to so getting better sleep 
Now, this person has put together four rest levels uh, for the uh, necessities. So, one is harsh, unple- then we got two unpleasant, three agreeable, and four comfortable. So, like, if you're only meeting a few of these uh, necessities, like maybe uh, you got shelter, but no food, you're not comfortable, eh, you got a fire. Okay, mm. that's a two. So unpleasant resting. Right. So it, that's pretty simple. If, if you have uh, three of these, congratulations, that's agreeable. You get a normal rest. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really fair enough. I mean, if, if you got a campfire your tent and something to eat under most circumstances, this is going to be very unintrusive to your travel and uh, campaign on overall. Right. Now this does come with like consequences and perks as uh, things go with the, this rule that uh, someone has put together. I'll, I'll plug their name after I'm done reading through all of it, but actually I'll pop it up on the screen here. How rude of me. So let's see. Uh, so rem- remember the use uh, these necessities as uh, to use these necessities as inspiration for developing in, in interesting consequences, parents perks. A fire creating warmth may attract creatures nearby. The chef feat may give a player the ability to make food worth uh, two necessities. Okay. A nice. bard's song of rest may count towards comfort for a long rest but their hours of performance may cause them to lose out on the benefits of a rest. Okay, so like uh, uh-huh. utilizing f- features that characters would already use as part of the, your resting. So that's I like that. That's interesting yeah. right there. Very intuitive. All right. Then let's see. The rested condition. Rejuvenated from a comfortable rest, you find yourself resistant to the exertion of adventure. The next level of exhaustion a rested creature gains is ignored. Ooh. After which the condition ends. The, this condition lasts for 24 hours. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, so you can push yourself a little bit harder after a hard night's sleep. I like that. And then, like, moving on to the hit dice portion of this. Well, hold on, wait, really quick. Oh, yeah? I also, I wonder if gaining the rested condition would also cure like a point like an extra point of exhaustion i actually that's uh, something right at the end bit oh, right yeah? here ah. yeah. so an agreeable uh resting condition would uh remove one point of exhaustion okay com- comfortable removes two nice so that right there, real nice. And let's see, like I was saying with the hit dice, a character can spend one or more hit dice at the end of a short or long rest up to the character's maximum number of hit dice, which is equal to the character's level. For each uh, hit die spent in this way, the player rolls the die and adds the character's constitution modifier. The character regains hit points equal to the total uh, to a minimum of zero. The player can decide to spend an additional hit die after each roll. A character regains some spent hit dice upon finishing a long rest as explained below. All right. So instead of just automatic full health when you hit a long rest, you actually have to roll for it. Nice. So you can spend your uh, hit dice. So that puts more emphasis on using those. And then for a short rest, it can, short rest is, instead of being like an hour, it'll be at least 30 minutes long, during which a character does nothing more strenuous than eating, drinking, reading, or tending to their wounds. In order to gain the benefits of a short rest, a character must at minimum fulfill the requirements uh, for a harsh rest. Okay, so at least, you know, be either comfortable eating warm or under some form of shelter right which easy to meet those requirements yeah you you have like the maybe your druid of the party druid craft you a little little hut you know somebody can make a fire somebody's able to kill a squirrel or something you know you can figure it out oh cool this actually goes a little bit further 
If they meet the required necessities for a comfortable rest, the character gains temporary uh, hit points equal to their constitution modifier plus their level at the end of a short rest. Nice. A character that regains spell slots after a short rest follows the rules for doing so from, a, from the long rest section below. Okay. Okay, so that's, that's pretty neat. Then uh, going on to the long rest, uh, a long rest is a period of extended downtime, at least eight hours during which a character sleeps for at least six hours and performs no more than two hours of light activity, such as reading, talking, eating, or standing watch. If the rest is interrupted by an hour period of strenuous activity, walking, fighting, casting spells, or similar adventuring activity, the character must begin to rest again and... Uh, rest again to gain any benefit from it. A character can't uh, benefit from more than one long rest per 24-hour period. And a character must have at least one hit point to start uh, at the start of the rest to gain its benefits. Alright. So, that kind of uh, gets rid of how a lot of people like to break things with uh, the resting mechanic in D&D. Mm-hmm. As I'm sure both of you are relatively familiar with, like someone's like, "Oh, yeah. hey, why don't we just long rest here?" Well, you just had like a long rest two hours ago. Let's do it again. Yeah. Or like the caster, are like, "Well, yeah, I'm out of spells already. So let's take a long rest." Like, we it's had the middle breakfast. of the day. Yeah, it's <laughs> like noon. You woke up at ten. <laughs> <laughs> like your characters, like, yeah, I'm gonna take a six-hour nap. Like, it's like, excuse me, the body don't work that way. You might be tired, but you ain't sleepy, buddy. Yeah, unless you got some fucking sleep spell, somebody put you under. <laughs> I'm gonna force him to take a long rest. Can Can you do that with the sleep spell? The sleep spell is hit point is hit point dependent, so you could <laughs> if someone's damaged enough or low level. Let's see, going without a long rest. When you end a 24-hour period without finishing a long rest, you must succeed on a DC-10 con save or suffer one level of exhaustion. It becomes harder to fight off exhaustion if you stay awake for multiple days after the 24 hours. The DC increases by 5 for each consecutive 24-hour period without a long rest. The DC resets to 10 when you finish a long rest. I don't know how often that would come up in any game, but it's nice that it's there. You know, I I have some ideas. I had uh, a character I created a while ago, I think, who had, like, he was a warlock that had something to do with, like, a dream god. Right? Oh, yeah? So he would go very long periods without sleeping. And then he would have to do, like, a meditative, okay. like, sleep or whatever. And, like, I, I could see these kind of, like, coming into play. That'd be interesting, because, like, warlocks are... They can take a short rest to regain their spell slots, so... Mm-hmm. You'd be purposely, like, losing out on your long rest abilities just for, like, a, your whole patron, so that might be interesting. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Hit points and hit dice again. At the end of a long rest, before spending any hit dice, a character regains a number of hit points equal to the corresponding value in the HP regained column. Okay, so they have like a little uh, column thing at the bottom. Hmm. And let's see here. So you will, so with that you kind of regain a minimum of uh, HP. Minimum of zero? Uh, well, let's <laughs> see. It, for a uh, harsh rest level, uh, you regain your con modifier as a minimum. Right. right. Okay, so there's that. At the unpleasant level, it's your constitution uh, mod plus your level. And then if it if you hit agreeable, you regain all of your hit points. Nice. And if you're comfortable, all hit points plus temp HP, which is you know, con plus that, level. So it's actually what very... About. Very easy and really, like, it's not all that different from the traditional rest system. Mm-hmm. You know, something I've always thought about is uh, 
players who have like a negative modifier to their constitution yeah being more prone to like diseases and stuff like that (laughs) well (laughs) not enough people throw diseases into their games and like i've seen tons of diseases for like uh stuff in previous Mm -hmm. editions and i've imported them into my in the games i run because hey uh you got uh, insert disease here uh, because you contracted it from getting bit by a rat. Sucks to yeah. you, buddy. I you failed the con saves. Bro, like... <laughs> I mean, so the uh, Tomb of Annihilation, I yeah. got so many people with diseases because that actually yeah. has a, a, a big laundry list. The Grim, the five the Grim five Hollows five books has uh, diseases. Yeah, mm. and I used to love one. Uh, it was, um, uh, was it uh, throat... Uh, uh, Throat, um, throat leeches. It, it, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's called throat leeches, but there's no leeches that go into your throat. It's just oh. your throat will swell up, and you start getting like dizzy, and and it's harder to breathe, and you start getting levels of exhaustion and stuff. But essentially, it's whenever you go into uh, any body of water in Schult, uh you have to do a con save to hold your breath. And if any water gets into your throat and gets down into your into your uh, down into your mouth and throat, you can you 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 essentially get the disease. And right. uh, yeah, and it doesn't like show up right away. Ah, and so it's kind of like so, a microbe type situation. Like it has to grow yeah. a bit. I would, yeah, I would like, love the idea of like magic diseases too that like affect. Well, your there spell used casting. there used to be a uh, mummy rot, um, uh, uh, something slime. Um, so mm-hmm. mummy rot was one that, uh, essentially, uh, you, when you get it, you start turning to dust <sighs> slowly over time. It was a disease that you slowly Jesus like Christ. just started disintegrating, but it wasn't like instantaneous. It was slow. Wait, so like, like eventually like your decay. nose and your cartilage would just start crumbling away. Your fingers would start oh, crumbling yeah. away. Oh, yeah. Damn. The other one was, uh, a, a, you, you essentially turned into a gelatinous creature. <laughs> Like a gelatinous <laughs> cube or whatever, your all Yikes. your your bones and your internal organs and stuff like that started liquefying, and you, I'm a jelly your skin now. started becoming I'm a jelly like now. <laughs> you just become yeah, a you started becoming just like a gel, gelatinous cube. That's crazy. A slimy doom. That's what it was called. Slimy doom. Yikes! <laughs> Makes me think like Jelly Jiggler from Bo 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 Bo. It's kind of like how we had one of our companions in our campaign uh, contract like a curse disease. Yeah, poor stonk. Rest in peace. Well, I mean, he's not that yet, but you know, yeah, he's, he's suffering. He's 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 trooping. He's getting <laughs> the he's making the saves. <laughs> All right, I, I am almost done here. So after I'm gaining uh, hit points and spending hit dice, a character gains up to half their total uh, number of hit dice to a minimum of one. If the character has oh yeah, so it gives a little example when you finish a long rest, uh, which you slept. If you slept in medium or heavy heavy armor, you only regain a quarter of your uh, the hit dice spent to a minimum of one. Uh, if you have any levels of exhaustion, the rest doesn't reduce your exhaustion level. See, that right there is actually, I like that, because too many people feel like, yeah. oh, we got attacked in the middle of the night. I, I was sleeping in my armor the entire time. Yeah, fuck off, buddy. Sure you were. Right. Yeah, we need to make more rules for donning and doffing armor than like Three, making making it clear when you're not wearing armor. Three point five actually, uh, their ruling was you couldn't you couldn't get the benefit of any rest if you're in armor. You yeah. just couldn't get it. So like you had to off uh, don and uh, and put on armor, and there was a time constraint. Like it took like I think it was like five mm-hmm. minutes to put on heavy armor, one minute for medium, thirty mm-hmm. seconds for light. And things like sense. this so yeah. like if you were attacked in the middle of the night sometimes you'd have to do that encounter without armor right or you're so. really like hold them off guys while i put my armor on yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't say anything about light armor and because light armor is very unintrusive in terms yeah, of uh, you could probably your sleep comfort in, like, like i, I could probably like sleep leather. In, you know it's like, yeah you could, you could sleep in like a leather clothing you know i mean studded is actually light... kind of hard yeah mm-hmm. sometimes like lightly padded yeah but I would imagine it's easier than sleeping in a full, like, uh, yeah, you're full plate, you know, food. like, like dude, that chain mail keep you awake all night. <laughs> yeah, you're not sleeping in a chain shirt. Like, it's, it's not happening. <laughs> I wear my chain shirt to bed. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a big old chain nightgown. 
<laughs> All right. But I, I actually do agree with that. And that's something that I kind of uh, do in my campaigns where it's just like, if, if you slept in a medium or heavy armor, well, congratulations. You're not going to get the full benefits, buddy. Mm-hmm. Luckily, I've, I've played characters that wear heavy armor. Uh, do not need to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have managed to subvert that whenever I run a game. <laughs> Okay, finishing this off, when regaining spell slots after a harsh or unpleasant long rest, you regain uh, about half rounded down or up, depending on which uh, conditions it were. It, it was. So half your spell slots rounded down in harsh conditions. Unpleasant would be half your spell slots rounded up. Okay. And, and agreeable and comfortable, you get all your spell slots back. Nice. So really, this this whole thing just puts more of an emphasis on motherfucker set up camp. Let the mm-hmm. ranger be important for once. Because like <laughs> at the start of uh, when fifth edition was released, rangers were fucking useless, and it's just like everyone's like, "Why are rangers so bad?" I don't know. Maybe it's because you don't actually have survival scenarios in your games. True. And everyone's too soft on their play. Give people more more reason to role play those scenarios and like the. Setting up camp and clearing an area, making sure it's safe, putting up traps, like, yeah, you know, whatever, creating a perimeter, you know, so yeah, I think it's cool. And honestly, the this really only punishes you if you have bad uh, long rest conditions. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. say you want a long rest in a dungeon. Okay, well, that's technically shelter. Just make. It's more shelter if you block off anything that would get in and out. Right. You so, find a secluded room, you block off the entrances. Okay, so that's uh, your shelter portion. And then uh, the second portion is either heat or a meal. Mm-hmm. So two of those conditions, that gets you to unpleasant. And so if you have managed to bring blankets with you, because everyone's got a bedroll, mm-hmm. and you bring food. Okay, so shelter... Food, bedroll, congratulations, you get your full rest, and it's of no impact to the game. But when you don't do things and you don't have these resources, now you got to start thinking. And I think when people get lazy, this is a good way to punish the laziness. Yeah. While keeping it interesting. Yeah, keeping it good like for roleplay reasons and everything. Like, someone says they want a long rest in the cart. Well, congratulations. Uh, long resting in a cart uh, will get you half your spell slots back because that's just uncomfortable. Yeah. You're in a moving vehicle. Like, yeah. the best you're getting around. is, like, you're laying on some blankets. Like, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it, it really is just, like, it comes down to best possible scenario. Uh, you're in a comfortable place. You're in your home base. You're always mm-hmm. going to be extra topped off for everything you do. So it rewards players having a base to go yeah. to. And it makes it and it kind of punishes uh, bad practices when it comes to your whole, oh, I'm just going to go lay on the this pile of rocks. <laughs> yeah. It also rewards people for getting, um, was it, uh, Hell's Instant house yeah 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 uh, spells like yeah, that. so, so you yeah, could use like that tiny hut or something like that exactly yeah so it rewards people for picking uh, spells heroes feast and shit like that exactly yeah oh, it, it makes yeah. those worthwhile because then all of a sudden it's like oh we're out of rations i got a single spell slot left i i will use it to feed us but uh, someone needs to set the fire and it's just you know it yeah. really builds into the role play and dynamics. Yeah. Also, you might think twice about blowing that last spell slot while you're out on the road when you're True. in a battle because you might need that spell slot for like good berries or Fucking the eat, feast bro. or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> good you berries become water. the senzu beans of the D D world. Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> and this was all brought to us by Shrub Dad. Reddit user Thank you, Shrub, Shrub Dad. Dad. <laughs> Thank you, Shrub Daddy, for this uh, creation. Yeah, a lot of thought went into it. 
Yeah, and I'm definitely going to link that because it's awesome. I like it. Hell yeah. All right, Sam, what you got? All right. So I've always been a pretty big fan of like the puppet masters and like Naruto, you know, and like magic that use kind of like a puppet master system. So I found an item called the Helping Hand, which is a grappling hook prosthesis. This is created by Loot Tavern. We've talked about them a few times. Uh, we have. I, I yeah. really do like what they got. I'm always a big fan of this and their stuff. This one was made back in, looks like November of uh, last year. So Yeah, let me pull good. that up on our thing for you right there. Yeah, it looks pretty cool. It's like a uh, purple and gold kind of, you know, prosthetic arm with like a raven, uh, kind of like a plague doctory emblem on the on the elbow front. And it has like this whole slot where I guess you would feed this component into. Oh, yeah, that, that looks real sick. I like that. So we have the component, which is an aberration brain. Uh, so to make the humanoid-shaped puppets with multiple pairs of bladed arms somewhat less unsettling, Bomboku recommends judicious application of googly eyes and crayon smiles. <laughs> <laughs> instead of firing the hook with the prosthesis's hook property the prosthesis allows you to manipulate three mechanical puppets that grab onto the target instead of rope the, the, the puppets are connected to the prosthesis by wires of pure magic which can't be damaged or destroyed it otherwise functions in the same way the prosthesis has four charges and regains 1d4 expended charges daily at dawn so we have the first ability Improved hook shot. As an action, while the puppets are attached to a target, you can reel yourself in. When you do, you move a number of feet up to the item's hook shot range in a straight line toward the puppets. In addition, the DC of the ability check will require to forcibly detach the puppets to 13. Next, we have assistance at a distance. As a bonus action, you can expend one charge to take the help action, manipulating the puppets to support your allies. When you do so to aid an ally in attacking a creature, the target of that attack can be up to 40 feet away from you. Alternatively, you can expend one charge as a bonus action to have the puppets feed a potion to a willing creature that you can see within 40 feet of you. And I can also imagine, you know, you can get a little more creative with that. But I, I love the idea of a puppet master or puppet magic in D D just in general. Oh, absolutely. So like this is really cool. And yeah, I always come to mind of like, you know, Kangaroo from like Naruto, right? Yeah. Yeah, like sorcery. Like <laughs> Yeah, like I've always been a big Imagine... fan of puppet masters in that regard. <laughs> and like I've even tried my hand at home brewing a few uh like a Back in 3.5, it was horribly unbalanced, but I tried to make my own puppet master class. What cool would that be in D&D? Like, this is my character, this is my puppet. Yeah, <laughs> it got a little ridiculous when I was like, okay, let's scale the puppets. And then by the time you get up to around 20th level, it's like Howl's Moving Castle, and you can turn one of your puppets into a, yeah. a mobile base for your party. And I don't like, see why not. Well, that's what I thought, but then, like, the realization of how people would abuse that, just like, okay, I'm going to just drop our base on somebody. <laughs> I mean, couldn't why you can't you? <laughs> couldn't you flavor the artificers? Uh, was it the, not the Battlemaster? Is the Battlemaster the one that gets the pet? The I robot pet? You could. Yep. Yeah. You could flavor that. So you could, like, I, you take could, your actions. But, to... like, I'd want to have more, like, uh, puppet master type abilities. Yeah, I, I yeah. did, however, in the Naruto sphere, put together a pretty decent, uh, what I call the bomb sculptor class, a uh, subclass Ooh. for the artificer, which is purely uh, based on, uh, uh, I think it's Didera or Didera. Uh, yeah, they were or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, he had the uh, oh nice. He yeah, had the, the clay like, hand, yeah. the clay, the clay bombs and everything. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Or is an explosion. Yeah, oh, yeah. that guy. I love them. And, character. like, it's been pretty well received on D&D Beyond whenever I've uh, checked up on it. Nice. But yeah, this is a fairly simple item, I feel, but I like it a lot. It makes me nostalgic for that kind of Puppet Master feel. And I always kind of thought it'd be cool to have a character like that or have abilities like that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so shout out to Loop Tavern. Shout out to the Patreon once again. 
Thank you for your creations. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> and I'm just making sure like, I got all that properly taken care of. So I'm, like, I'm looking at like the little puppets. And they look so cool. They look like little guys with hats and capes. <laughs> <laughs> and they have like little swords and claws. I like it. <laughs> Like, I, I really do like the puppet vibe. And, like, I, I just, for the longest time, I wanted to do a puppet master because, like, I love the concept of someone, like, being able to do the Sasori thing at a higher level and hide oh. inside their puppet. Oh, I, I always love the idea of someone, like, oh, just I've got to get serious. They, like, pull their sleeve up. You see a robotic arm. <laughs> like, what the fuck? <laughs> if, you know, anime logic. Anime yeah. logic everywhere. Okay, well, is there anything else you guys want to touch on before we close things out? That's all I have. <laughs> Hit up all my notes. All right, Alden. Uh, where can people uh, find you and uh, any uh, plugs that you want to drop for your uh, podcast that you've been working on? Um, I mean, most of the time uh, we have it on uh, YouTube, which is... Uh, swag which is uh s w or s dot w dot um i'm brain farting here i am i am not <laughs> well put together I'm starting to get tired that's all. I, I feel that i feel that so uh but it's uh swag with a dot in between each of the the letters yeah. on youtube um, we only have the one video up right now. Um, oh, he's trying to throw. Like a little baby <laughs> I, I did actually help out a little bit with the, some of the audio editing for that. Nice, nice. Yes. Shameless plug. <laughs> All the shameless. But uh, yeah, so, um, but yeah, it's on YouTube. Um, we're we're still getting it. Like we said, we're getting scheduling issues, and then uh, one of our one of the people that we're doing doing it with is actually moving to Brazil, so um, uh, we're so, we're, so we're trying to figure out it. Kind of Z for us. Oh yeah. Damn. So we we're, we're we're trying to figure out if we're going to do it with the 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 less uh, lesser staff, or we're going to see if we're going to get someone else onto it. So there's a little bit of things, but it, it's 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 uh, we're all new, we're all brand new to it. So there's a lot of uh, trial and error and figuring out things. <laughs> Absolutely. For, new stuff because a lot of us are very very new to the the whole podcasting and and making right. content and stuff like that um but all of us are lifelong uh geeks and we all do a lot of a lot of gaming and stuff like that it was just uh it, it all came about um with the fact that uh we we were all tournament grinders so we all like yeah. play in tournaments and mm. and things like this and we all just started that we were like hey why don't we just throw this together sometime oh yeah so awesome so we'll definitely have to put a link in the description for your uh, ch YouTube channel there. Yeah, yeah, yeah I definitely. Thanks will. for coming on. It was great to meet you. Oh yeah, no problem. That'd be yeah. talking about dinosaurs. Ah <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, everyone's favorite. Uh, everyone's favorite topic right there: dinosaurs. Yeah. Dude, you remember that? Right. I, I, they had? <laughs> the the only thing that I think is I feel bad about dinosaurs is the the CRs never match up. Uh, they, yeah, they say right, like a T-Rex right. is like a CR8 and I've had like level 5 characters just four level 5 characters really like give a, a T-Rex a power cuz they don't they don't have any like special they're just beasts like they don't Yeah they're, they're just like health tanks special. Yeah they're just like big old health tanks and if you build it right you can burn through health, hit points like there's nobody's yeah, yeah, business yeah. I I think maybe it's one of those things where like uh you just kind of treat a dinosaur like the destructive force of nature that it kind of is right. and it, it's gonna like a lot of CRs are screwed up by like DMs not running them by the tactics that they would normally have. Right. And that's why I'm a big fan of the book The Monsters Know, because like you know? slap that uh, audiobook on when you're doing a little when you need to get some game prep in while you're driving. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Go ahead and close this out. Well, as always, this is Dungeons and Talk Shows. And you can check out more of our stuff at the YouTubes and the tw over on Twitter at the Nerd Militia Zero. And you can find all of our other social media links on Linktree. So, mm -hmm. yeah. 
join the adventure, stay nerdy, and uh, see you next week. <laughs> see you next week. <laughs>